Ryan, the voice of the New York Mets, Howie Rose. Howie, how thrilling is it for you all these years to be doing it? I mean, think about it. You know this franchise better than anybody. 11th postseason appearance in their history. How thrilling is it for you to get to do a postseason call? It's special. Hi, guys. It's, it's always special because you get a different flow of adrenaline, a different feeling of, you can call it nervousness or anxiety, but, you know, it's just a unique feeling that it's almost impossible to explain. And I know fans get it, too. And once you have it, it stays with you for the entirety of however long you go in the postseason. So uh, I, I welcome it back. Uh, no doubt. Howie, just take us through the ride there. Obviously, the interruption down in Atlanta, the extended travel, not knowing what's going on, you know, having to win one and then dealing with the second game. And then yesterday, quick flight. I mean, that is logistically, it's got to be the biggest challenge you've ever faced as a, the team, too. But you as a broadcaster, right? Well, not really, no. only in the sense that, well, because I just go where they go. You know, <laughs> Just tell me where we're going. What time do I need to be on the bus? What time is the plane? And, um, and I'll, I'll be with you guys. The one who really had his hands full and really still does is Edgar Suero, who's the Mets director of team travel. And, you know, he's the guy who had to prepare for all these eventualities that we couldn't predict. So uh, I wouldn't have wanted to be him over the last few days. But for the rest of us, we just enjoy the ride. Did you think, Howie, this was a bad matchup going in, Mets versus Brewers, as opposed to the Padres? Sal, my boy, you're talking to someone who remembers 1988. You could look at the Brewers and everything they've done against the Mets over the last few years, and all I remember is winning 10 out of 11 from the Dodgers Hmm. in 88, and everybody's saying it's going to be a cakewalk to the pennant. And then came Kirk Gibson and Oral Hershiser and have a nice offseason. So um, I've learned not to take anything for granted either way. I know that there's a lot of pressure on this Milwaukee club because they're in the postseason virtually every year. This is six out of the last seven. And save for one trip to the National League Championship Series a few years ago, they never go anywhere. And so as much heat as you could put locally on the Brewers here, considering that this is a Packers town and it is NFL season right now, you know, they're under some pressure here. And Mm -hmm. the Mets... They're not playing with house money. They're good. And I think I told you guys this a couple of weeks ago. It's just my opinion. But I think that any of the 12 teams that got into the postseason this year can win it all. There's no superpower. So when you're a team that's finished first as often as the Brewers have and have really nothing to show for it, you know, for the Mets, it's, hey, let those guys have the pressure. And the Mets will just go out and do what they've done all year, which is be their resilient self. Yeah, we've we saw said, it again last night. I'm, I'm, pardon me, Abby. We've said that as well. There's, there's no superpower, which obviously places more emphasis on managing. So, you know, Mendoza hit a lot of right buttons yesterday. Winker gets the start. Boom, two-run triple. Martinez pinch hit. Boom, single. Vientos in the four spot. Couple of hits, couple of ribbies. Not pulling Sevy. He's just, um, he's got that additional sense. His anticipation is phenomenal, and his gut has been spot on so far. Well, I think he's done a terrific job, and and we've discussed that before, too. And some moves you make, you wonder why at times, as any manager does, and then, you know, they, they clarify themselves. Now, I know there are a lot of people who are scratching their heads on Sunday in the game here in Milwaukee when... Edwin Diaz threw 26 pitches, and they wondered why in a game the Mets were winning, I think, 5 to nothing at the time. Why would he use Diaz? He got a doubleheader tomorrow. Well, the fact of the matter was Diaz hadn't pitched in a week, and, and closers can get pretty stale. So he probably ended up throwing more pitches that day than they envisioned or would have liked. And certainly he teetered on, on Monday in that first game. But the fact that he was able to bounce back and get it done in the ninth inning um, was telling as well. And he wasn't available last night. I assume he might be available tonight, but what he throws 66 pitches in two days at this time of year, that's a lot. But, you know, they say that they, they held him back at times all year for challenges like this. And that's, you know, kind of what Mendoza's MO has been all year. And 
And you're right. You know, most of the buttons he's pushed have been the correct ones. And for me, Howie, we're talking about Howie Rose. This is one of the smartest, if not the smartest, deepest Mets teams I can remember watching in my lifetime. They have a game plan going in, and then they have an answer for everything, whether it's a lefty or righty matchup, whether it's defensive replacements late. You look up, and they're buttoned up. They're tight. They're deep. Where do you think this team ranks as far as being smart, having a game plan, then executing that game plan with a deep roster? Well, I think it starts with the management of the team. David Stearns and um, even Eduardo Brizuelo, who is his assistant, and obviously in the dugout, Carlos Mendoza. It starts there. You talk about bright and intelligent and prepared. I think this is uh, a combination that exemplifies those traits uh, probably better or more so than any recent Mets administration, and maybe even going further back than even the recent past, they're in great hands. And I, I've said this all year, from ownership on down through the front office to the manager, I think they struck gold with Carlos Mendoza. And, you know, David Stearns is not only a bright guy, we know that. He's accomplished. We see what he's built on a shoestring budget in Milwaukee. But you know what? The guy grew up a Mets fan, too. So he's invested in this in kind of a unique way. And I know that ultimately doesn't mean a whole lot, but anytime you can put just a little extra emotion behind the pragmatism and the intelligence that are innate to him to begin with, it makes for a pretty nice souffle. Yeah, oh, well, very well said. That was a very nice play on words, of course. Howie Rose, BT, and Sal. So the Lindor home run, let's stack it up for you. Everybody's got their opinion. Where's it rank? Oh, it's right up there. As far as Mets uh, regular season home runs, that's about as big as it gets. You know, people started thinking back, as I did, about just the home runs period in Mets history. And you go to Todd Pratt, which won a division series. That was a big one. And, you know, Mike Piazza's home run on September 21st of 2001 is just kind of in a different category because that was more about Americana than it was baseball. And, you know, you can go back and look at Daryl Strawberry's home run off the clock in St. Louis in 1985 or the two home runs that Ron Swoboda hit against Steve Carlton in 69, the same night that Carlton had struck out 19. But given what was on the line that day, in that moment, in this season, you can make a strong case that Francisco Lindor's home run was the biggest home run ever hit by a Met in regular season play. Did you think it was gone right away? Because on TV, it looked like a, as you sound odd, like a pop-up, but I didn't think it was gone right away. Well, the, re- the reason it looked like a pop-up, and I understand why people would think that, is because of the location that we have. Our broadcast vantage point in Atlanta is, is kind of high up. It's not as high, not that you guys would know this, but just to add a little color to it, um, for example, the broadcast booth in Washington at Nationals Park is like sitting in the upper deck at Shea Stadium. It's that high. And the broadcast booth in Atlanta, whereas it's lower than that, is still higher than most. And I think between, not that it was a particularly sunny day Monday, but maybe the angle of the sun, the field is a little less plush and green than some others, and maybe it was just a higher sky. But whatever it was, when the ball got up in the air Monday, I'm not talking about Francisco's necessarily, but just generally, when the ball got up in the air Monday, it was hard to track. And to this day, I still don't know exactly where Nimmo's home run landed. I mean, that was a shot. We're trained as broadcasters to watch the outfielder. Um, I knew off the bat Lindor had hit it well. Uh, I, you know, we count one Mississippi. We didn't even have that much time for it to register to me that, oh boy, this, this one, I'm not even going to say it's got a chance, yeah. but it, you know, it, I thought off the bat that it was going for a, a, a pretty good run. And again, we watched the outfielders. Yeah. When I saw Harris go back the way he did, that's when I realized this baby was going to be fun. BT and Sal on the fan. We're talking with Howie Rose. Where would you rank that game, Howie? The only regular season game in my lifetime that I could compare it to was the 99 Mets-Yankees Subway Series Matt Franco game, the back and forth yeah. all afternoon. First time they took two out of three from the Yanks. This was obviously different with something legitimate at stake as opposed to just city right. in city bragging rights. Where would you rank that game in regular season Mets history? I, I think right now it's at the top of the list because of what was at stake. I mean, I don't get as caught up in the Subway Series as a lot of people do. 
who knows, maybe we'll have another one next month or later this month. But wouldn't that be great? <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, the Matt Franco game was fun. But it was what it was. It was a game in June or July or whenever it was. And, yeah, it was against the Yankees. And I know how caught up fans are in it. But at the end of the day, it was a midseason game. It meant more to the fans um, in terms of desperation to win than it did the one game in the standings at that point of the year. And what I remember about that game, as much as the Matt Franco hit that won it, was Mike Piazza's home run off of Ramiro Mendoza. I happened to be, because I was doing TV with the Mets then, and that was a nationally televised game, so I wasn't working. I actually was sitting downstairs on the third base side with my wife and daughters. And when Piazza hit that home run off of Ramiro Mendoza, it made a sound off the bat that I don't know I had ever heard before. And it landed, I think, even beyond the tent, which they had constructed temporarily for um, promotional reasons during the Subway Series beyond the left field bullpen. Uh, I joked that it was the first home run hit in the history of City Field because <laughs> the ball landed about where the left field stands are now at City Field. So that's what I remember what everybody calls the Matt Franco game for. But to wow. me, there's no comparison. This game put the Mets in the postseason. That game was fun game against the Yankees, but at the end of the day, big deal. Howie, let's fast forward to tonight. Let's just say Mets four, Brewers three, ninth <laughs> Diaz out. What's your level of confidence in Diaz tonight? Generally, you can tell from the first batter, <laughs> and I can't predict what that's going to be, but I, I just hope that if that's the scenario, that he's well enough rested because that was quite a workload Sunday and Monday. And I know that guys have a tremendous ability when they're as athletically gifted as every one of these players are to feed off the adrenaline and generally deal with the fatigue later. But as I mentioned the other day, when Diaz didn't cover first base, he can be fragile at times. And the thing that would worry me tonight is, is if he walks the leadoff guy, for example, um, because those are indications sometimes that there could be trouble brewing, pardon the unintentional pun. Hmm. Um, so I think we know, or I will get the feeling that that first hitter will be as much of an indicator of what Diaz is going to be about tonight as, as anything that transpires in that inning. I would love from the Mets standpoint, um, <laughs> I guess every Mets fan would too, to have, if not a nice breezy one tonight, yeah. then maybe one that doesn't come down to having to go to Diaz. Because if you win tonight, then they're off Thursday and Friday. And believe me, with what's been going on here recently, those two days would be gold. Oh, my God. What an advantage. Do you look at not covering first base as an isolated, you know, just a little bit of a brain cramp or maybe a deeper yeah. issue that's uh, plagued them on the mound? No, no, nothing deeper. Just okay. you know, one of those things. He said that he thought the ball was, was foul, foul, going yeah. foul. Okay. And, you know, all right, he, he made a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, because we've seen it often enough, that when something like that happens, sometimes the results afterwards are not great. And that's why, to me, I think my eyes have kind of learned that the first batter very often for, for Edwin is the indicator. How about Sean Mania tonight, Howie? He has been their ace, and not even just their ace. He's been an ace the majority of the second part of the season here yeah. uh, outside of Friday night in Milwaukee last time he faced his Brewers team. What are your expectations for Mania tonight? Well, I'd like to think you can look at the last one as more the aberration than anything. He's not had great postseason um, success, but, you know, Frankie Montas, although he was at times could be dominant, um, took a lot of time on the mound on Friday night. He was very deliberate, occasionally wild. And this is a Brewers team that, although they were the second best team in the National League in terms of, in terms of ERA, their best pitchers in the rotation walk a lot of batters. You know, Peralta last night, I think he was sixth in the league in walks. Montas walked a lot of hitters, too. Um, and the Mets have put together so many good at-bats lately that that's one area where if they can exploit Montas early and get to a bullpen that was used a lot last night, then that would be a huge early edge to the Mets. And just real quickly, we're talking about big at-bats and disciplined at-bats and, and terrific at-bats. 
How about the at bat that Tyrone Taylor had against Schwellenbach to oh begin my God. the eighth inning? On that was Monday. awesome. I that would, was phenomenal. Now, you, you guys both go back to 1986, right? You yep. can remember the postseason? Yes. I hope. Yeah, 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 I mean, I, I've seen a year to remember a million times, even though it was okay. seven years old in 86, but I'm familiar with it, yes. Well, if you remember game six in 86 against the Astros, and that's what I really started to compare Monday's game to as we were going through the final stages of that game. If you remember going to the ninth inning of game six of the LCS in Houston in 86, mm. Bob Nepper had shoved it right up their butts and they didn't sniff Nepper for eight innings. Lenny Dykstra leads off the ninth. And I don't even remember. It could have been the first pitch. It could have been the sixth. I don't remember, but Dykstra hits a triple to start the inning. Were you covering the team and, at the time? Howie? What were you doing at that point? Uh, in that, that game in 80s, I was working for WCBS radio. Okay. Okay. Um, and I was a reporter, but I was not at that game. I was sitting in my living room, um, just, you know, as wrapped up in it as everybody else was. But when Dykstra hit that triple to lead off against Nepper in the ninth inning, it was as though a, flip, a, a switch flipped. And when Taylor had the at bat that he did on Monday and, and ultimately doubled, I felt the exact same sensation. Now, in 86, Nepper stayed on a little bit longer. The Mets were three runs down. They tied the game. What they did on Monday was to get Schwellenbach out of the game, go to two guys in the bullpen who have been money for the Braves, Jimenez and Iglesias, get to them both, take the lead. We know what happened after that and the back and forth. But I look at that Tyrone Taylor at bat on Monday to begin the ninth inning, uh, or pardon me, the eighth inning, as one of the most memorable and important at bats in the history of the franchise. Wow. And I hope that doesn't get overlooked when we think back on this game as we will for years to come. No, we brought it up the next day. There's no doubt. Uh, a lot of Mets fans out in Milwaukee. I mean, I know that those that are there are loud. How many we have? Some, I, I wouldn't say as many as we've seen in, um, even in Milwaukee this past weekend, Okay, but, um, but there were a whole lot of them stacked up behind the third base dugout, the Mets dugout last night, get ready for that final out. So uh, there were a couple of occasions where you could hear a faint "Let's go Mets" chant, um, but it, 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 let me tell you this: if they win tonight mm. or tomorrow night, I end up going to Philadelphia. You know, the Mets and Phillies have never had a postseason series with each other. That is amazing. That is going to be sick. Jeez. I'm telling you, wow. uh, it is going to be sick. I was just going to say, and, if, if, uh, if, if there'll be a lot more fans in there uh, if they do win one of these next two games on Saturday. There'll be a lot more fans there for Game One. Yeah, if they can if they can find their way in, you know, um, the Philly fans are great. They're just as passionate as Mets fans. I love it, and I hope that's what transpires. Do you think that's going to be the case? We'll get one of these two. Quintana yeah, tomorrow. I, is, I, can, I, I firmly believe that. I do. I really, really do. Oh, I love hearing that. And it is Quintana, or they have not announced that yet, Howie, for game three? They haven't announced it yet, but consider a couple of things. Number one, the Brewers – and remember, the Mets threw three lefties at them last weekend. The third, it didn't matter. But, um, you know, they uh, went with lefties Friday and Saturday against the Brewers, and Milwaukee won both games. But during the regular season, uh, leading into that series, I believe, the Brewers were one game over five hundred against left-handed starters. And they won 93 games. So they were decidedly better against right-handed starters. Mm. The choice would come down to, realistically, Quintana or what? Peterson, Peterson. on one left day? Right. Think back to how important it was for so many reasons to have won that first game in Milwaukee on Monday. It enabled them to set their rotation to where they can get these three guys on full rest. Because if they had to use Severino in game two on Monday, well, then last night conceivably would have been a bullpen game. And you wouldn't have had any of your starting pitchers in this series on regular rest. Um, so I think just the fact that you can get to tonight, well, I guess Manaya um, might well have been used on three days rest also last night, just looking at what the, the possibilities were, right? But to, um, to to have won that first game Monday and, and get their rotation set with, Severino, Manaya, and yeah, they use them tomorrow night. Quintana all on full rest. 
uh, you know, uh, lefties against the left-handed starters, uh, against a team that struggles against left-handed starters. I think the Mets are in a great position here. I really do. Thank you, Howie. We appreciate it. As always, enjoy the ball game tonight. All right, guys. See you soon. Thanks, yeah, Howie. Hopefully next week. I mean, either way, we can maybe have Howie on just, to, uh, you know, if the Mets aren't playing, wrap up the season. But as Howie said, he expects it. And I kind of feel the same way. Like, who the hell knows? But... How can you not after last night? I expect the Mets to be heading to Philadelphia. I do, too. On Saturday. I don't know if it's in two or three, but it's they're, they're moving. 